So, Gail Collins, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to start by asking about your book project about Texas. Um, and I'm curious about the genesis of that. Um, how did you first get interested in writing a book about Texas? Well, I, it was a very strange thing. I had a friend in Austin, who Sylvia Acevedo, who was in my last book, which was about women in America and changes over the last um, 30, 40, 50 years. And um, I had been looking for somebody in Texas who was, I, I think I've, I've had some idea of exactly what I wanted, a professional woman. Or, but she was perfect, and she was a great interview, and we got to be friends. And she's very interested in Texas demographics. and kept giving me all these numbers about the exploding population of children in the state. And somehow, about um, several months ago, I ran into that video of um, Governor Perry saying that he believed in abstinence-only sex education because he had personally experienced that it worked. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, this exploding population, you know, governor of sex education, you know. And then, I looked at the numbers, and it was like Texas was going to be producing a tenth of the future workforce of America, and I thought, well, the stuff that's internal to Texas is actually important to all of us. And then I started looking at all the other ways that Texas impacts the rest of the country. And um, a publisher called me, actually, and said, wow, that's a really interesting thought. Do you want to um, do a book? And here we are. So do you feel like Texas is addressing problems that we're seeing across the country, or is it more about the, the way we're doing it specifically and what that means if, uh, yeah, obviously we have a very conservative political bent, if that political bent was followed through on a national level, if our approach to education and all our demographic issues were supersized nationally. Speak of supersized or just education, I give you no child left behind. There's exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more that uh, despite, it's so ironic, because when you come to Texas, Texans are so obsessed with the idea that they're victims of federal attempts to control them. When in fact, if you, at least the way I look at it, it seems that much more Texas is controlling the agenda for the rest of the country. And I just think that's fascinating, and everybody is interested in Texas. It's the one state everybody is interested in in the world, so it all worked out. Yeah, let me ask you about that, because I'm from the Northeast originally, and every time I go home, all my Yankee relatives are always asking me about Texas. It's a like family fascination now. There are some Texas jokes I have to endure. <laughs> but I'm curious about, and, and we find this too at The Observer, that um, so many of our stories here in Texas go nationally so easily. There is a Texas fascination. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about what is, you know, from, from coming from New York or D.C. or even the West Coast, what is the like... What is the basis of maybe the fascination that people have with, with Texas and, and some of our crazy Texas stories that we have? It's, it's to a great extent, I think, because Texas is such a culture unto itself. You know, I grew up in Ohio, and we did not run around in Ohio saying, what do you think of Ohio when people came to visit? Or do you like our Ohio culture here? Um, it just doesn't come up. People don't have that sense in most states that they're in a culture and an entity unto itself. And that's... I think a great deal of it. You have this very huge place that has this very strong sense of identity that's not, even in California, California tends to identify itself with a region, but not, I don't know many people who say I'm a Californian and this is my center of my life. So that's a huge part of it. Another huge part of it is there's something about Texas politics that allows its politicians to do very well in Washington so that we wind up being, you know, having the, gov the president or the vice president or the majority leader or some bunch of people who are hugely important to all of us because of their influence on our lives are always from Texas. So, there you are. Um, well, I want to switch gears and, and ask you a question about, uh, or ask you a question that many of us in Austin and Texas are thinking about now, and that's Rick Perry. <laughs> Running for president, um, I'm curious, what do you think of Perry as a potential presidential candidate? Oh, I'm praying for him to run for president. My God, you know, this is the thing, sort of thing I feed off of. You know, uh, I think it'd be great. I think he's actually, and this is all. I'm going to regret this later because I will mean when he becomes president, I will, you know, 
reminding myself that I underestimated. But he's a very silly person in many ways. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the kind of people that are easy to write about. So I'm thrilled. Do you think that... Go Perry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, do, do you think that there, uh, the bush fatigue issue is something yeah. that people talk about a lot. Um, and, and Perry, in a lot of ways, is very much like Bush. In fact, I sometimes think he's more Bush than Bush actually was. Uh, very charismatic. He's what George Bush wanted to be? Is that yeah, what very charismatic, an actual real born and bred Texan, yeah. uh, folksy. He can actually ride a horse. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we have yeah. the pictures yeah. to prove it. Yeah. Um, and, but yet, not in the policy at all. In fact, Bush maybe was more in the policy than mm -hmm. Perry actually is. So there are a lot of similarities. I wonder if you think that when Perry, if Perry goes mm -hmm. to a national campaign, do people outside of the state, is there still a sense of Bush fatigue, do you think, that, that he'll have to overcome? Well, there's definitely a sense of Bush fatigue that would have been a problem for Jeb Bush mm -hmm. if he had run. I don't know that there's actually a sense of Texas fatigue. Uh, and if there is, by the time we go through all the nominating process, and by then there will be certainly a, a Romney fatigue or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that people are expecting him to become president, but I could certainly imagine a situation where Mitt Romney was going to be the nominee and the Tea Party end was in hysterics and he reached out to Rick Perry as a good vice presidential candidate. It's easy to imagine. Terrifying what they <laughs> yeah. seem and it's easy to imagine. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and, and the primary would be interesting. You wrote, I think, recently that the Republican Party is obsessed with doing anything that they can to prevent Romney from being the nominee. Yes, but yet, yet he inexorably moves forward slowly but surely. So, I, you know, it's not at all unlikely he will be the nominee, mm -hmm. even though the Republicans all hate him. So <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I want to switch gears again um, and talk about an issue that we're also dealing here in Texas with and that we're seeing across the country, and that's cuts to family planning. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, maybe I should have been surprised, I was surprised in this last legislative session that we're just ending that uh, Texas cut family planning funds by two-thirds when we already have a very high teen pregnancy rate. Um, obviously, you, you've written about the absence of education and the success there yeah. or lack thereof. So um, I'm wondering if you were at all surprised about the attack on family planning both in Texas and in other states and in Washington. Um, it, it, what is the connection here between, obviously conservatives are, uh, many of them are anti-abortion, but how does they get from that to attacking family planning and going from a Tea Party election based on returning to the Constitution um, to grossly attacking family planning? It's counterintuitive because you would think people who didn't want there to be abortions would be, you know, really go family planning. but. In fact, a, the core of the anti-abortion movement, I mean, there are many, many people who are opposed to abortion who are behind the family plan, but the core activist groups, many of them are also opposed to basically any kind of outside of marriage sex. Uh, they just, and many of them, especially if they're groups that are attached to the Catholic Church, believe that most of the family planning methods, that contraceptives of almost everything, are, are also forms of abortion. They just think it's all immoral. So they don't really talk about that much because it's pretty clear that this is not where the country is. Uh, and there are a few legislators I've talked to in, in the legislature here that are anti-abortion who do have this theory about how you should really set up a lot of family planning clinics away from Planned Parenthood, which they don't like because of the abortion angle. But the time to do that was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. You don't do it at the end of, like, the beginning of a special session and suddenly cobble together this great plan for how you can put family planning somewhere else. I mean, people like Planned Parenthood have been carrying the load on this for years and years and years. They have a system. Nobody else has set up a system. And it's, it's just crazy. It's completely nuts. It's just extraordinary to me in Texas in particular where such a huge proportion of all the births are Medicaid funded that people who want to cut the budget so desperately are opposed to family planning. It, and it's, it's alliances, it's you know, background, it's history, but it's totally nuts. Yeah, because it, I mean, it seems like the, an ideology is getting in the way of what 
will probably cost the state money, you know, as you're, as you're talking about, or any state or even the federal government, um, with Medicaid, more, be, more Medicaid bursts and... There's um, just no way in a billion years this isn't going to be incredibly expensive for Texas. And that thought again about the rest of the country, you know, if Texas screws this up and has an enormous number of teenage pregnancies that it didn't need to have, and is stuck with the bill for them, but can't really afford to pay it because of all of the budget problems and the low tax rates, and the kids wind up going to really bad schools, to getting bad health care, and then they become the future workers of America, we are all screwed. So this is not just a Texas issue, even though it's happening in Texas. Mm -hmm. Finally, and I have, this is a bit of an offbeat question, but... Oh no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Reading your columns, one of my favorite recent lines that you wrote, you recently wrote a column about Perry, mm -hmm. and you had a great line in there about um, you're discussing Perry's opposition to the 17th Amendment and how he thinks tech, uh, legislatures should have more power to, uh, one general, but specifically to send senators Pick to Washington. Senators, yeah. yeah. And your line was, uh, have you seen state legislatures at work? Have you seen the Texas legislature? <laughs> I have, and I don't think it's a good idea. I thought that was hilarious as somebody who's covered the Texas legislature. And I'm curious, I, I know you, you kind of have a history with state politics and you cover Connecticut politics and you obviously you've been around Texas too. And I'm wondering if, if there are some favorite, crazy, unbelievable, stupid, funny moments or a moment that sticks out in your mind about a legislator, legislature or the Texas legislature or any legislature. You know, when you're running that line, is there something you were thinking of? That for for Texas itself this year, I have to say that the airport pat down thing was kind of my favorite crisis of the year. But I, I was sort of stunned looking through. Texas is falling behind in the completely lunatic right wing <laughs> legislation race. Utah has grabbed the cup and is running with it. And you know, unless you start working on your own currency minting system and um, get yourself an official state firearm, I don't know what we're going to do here. Yeah, we were discussing that in the office. I don't know if, if Texas needs an official state firearm or what you do with it, but then we also thought, well, if you have an official state firearm, then you have something to go out and shoot the state bird with. So, <laughs> um, well, um, Gail Collins, I want to thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for the time. Bye -bye.